Thanks. Is this uh, mic okay? That's good. <clears throat> okay. Well, when I first, uh, shortly after I first moved to Boulder about 15 years ago, uh, HAO had a strategic planning re retreat of some sort. And Michael, who was director at the time, uh, asked the junior scientists from each of the research sections to, uh, to put forward a vision uh, for HAO research in the future. Uh, but he asked, uh, he asked the junior uh, researchers from uh, one research section to provide the vision for a different section, okay? So I was in the solar interior section, and he asked me to provide a vision for the lower solar atmosphere section. So I gave a, a talk about how uh, you could do the solar stellar connection with lower stellar atmospheres. <clears throat> Uh, and it was provocative. I think that was part of the point. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. So uh, I ended the lecture actually with uh, something that I thought would be the least uh, controversial, which was uh, something that had recently been published uh, that the, about the uh, effect of posting your preprint on archive on your citation rate. And basically the authors showed that uh, if you, papers that were posted to the archive were cited twice as often as papers that were not. Uh, and at the time, solar physics as a culture didn't have, uh, didn't, didn't post most of their papers to archive. Solar physics was largely absent from the archive, uh, which I found strange as an astrophysicist coming in. And so it's just trying to encourage people to post their papers to archive, gain that visibility, and improve the impact overall. Uh, that turned out to be the most controversial thing that I said. Uh, and people were like, ah, you know, citations, they don't measure anything real and whatever. <laughs> so with that as a prelude, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is the most highly impactful research ever to come out of HAO as measured by their citations, okay? Um, and I'll try to connect each of the big three uh, research projects that I'll discuss to the current state of the art in those, in those fields as well. Uh, but first, just a little bit of history so we're all on the same page about HAO and its, and its background. Uh, his, uh, Harvard astrophysicist Walter Orr Roberts uh, was the founding director of HAO in 1940. Um, he went on to become the founding director of NCAR when it was established 20 years later and one of his conditions for accepting that post was that HAO should be incorporated into NCAR as one of the re research laboratories. Uh, after that time, there were various uh, changes in the scope of what HAO does. In the mid-1980s, there were uh, elements of the atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric science uh, researchers who studied the atmosphere, upper atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere of the Earth that were folded into to HAO and, and what it did. So the scope expanded in the mid 80s. Uh, and then more recently in the last decade, there have been some sort of downscoping of what HAO does. They eliminated astrophysics in 2011, 2012, and more recently eliminated solar dynamo research um, due, to, due to funding pressures, basically. Um, but Walter O. Roberts was, uh, was one of these people who thought very broadly, from what I understand, I never met him. Uh, and I think that's something that he shares with Michael. Okay, so the first, uh, I'm just gonna take a historical pers perspective, so we'll start in the beginning. And the first uh, most impactful uh, research paper to come out of HAO in its history was this paper uh, by uh, Andy Skumanich here in the front row uh, in 1972 uh, showing an empirical relation between uh, age and the rotation rate and activity level of stars like the sun. Uh, so basically, Andy uh, just looked at a few young star clusters where you knew the age from the age of the star cluster and the sun as the old uh, endpoint where we know the age from meteorites extremely precisely. Uh, and he noticed that uh, the rotation rate as measured just by the V sine I of the uh, in kilometers per second uh, of an average G star in these various clusters, and also the calcium, uh, calcium two emission in the, in the blue, uh, which is a long measured proxy of magnetic activity, 
uh, both of these things seem to decline together roughly with the square root of the age, a nice power law. Uh, this is a two-page paper, and this figure is half of one of those pages. Uh, and uh, it's been cited more than 1,300 times in the last 50 years. Uh, and so this is the citation history over time. You see, uh, after the first decade, there's a little boost there in the early 80s. That seems to be when the Einstein X-ray Observatory came out and started producing, in mass, uh, large numbers of rotation and activity measurements for sun-like stars. Uh, and then you see another boost uh, around about 2009. Anybody have a guess for what that might be? The launch of the Kepler mission, exactly. So suddenly Andy's work had renewed relevance uh, and an expanded audience uh, in the last uh, decade or, or more. Okay. So uh, prior to Kepler, uh, our understanding of the rotational evolution of stars has actually developed considerably since 1972. And uh, it's a little more complex than uh, Andy's power law which is kind of shown by the arrow there, uh, particularly at, at young ages, right? And the stars are born with a range of initial rotation uh, rates. It, so these young clusters have a, 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 a whole range of rotation rates. And initially, uh, there are, the stars' are, uh, rotation periods are locked to their protostellar disks. So they spend a, a few million years in that configuration they then uh, contract onto the main sequence, and so they spin up a little bit. Stars that uh, were initially rotating slowly spin up a little bit less. Uh, and then this process uh, called magnetic braking kicks in, where uh, the magnetized stellar winds gradually lose angular momentum over time. And that effect uh, depends uh, sensitively on the rotation rate. So stars that are initially rotating very fast break much more strongly than stars that are initially rotating slowly. And that leads to this convergence. By a billion years or less, uh, all the stars forget all those initial conditions and collapse onto this Schumannich spin-down sequence through the sun. Uh, so it was the first approximation of something that's a little bit more complicated, but uh, also rich in physics and uh, interesting. Uh, after Kepler, um, something unexpected happened. Suddenly, we could, through the use of astroseismology, measure very reliable ages for stars that were older than the sun, something that we didn't have before. Right? This uh, whole picture goes through the sun, but you don't see, there's basically no empirical calibrators beyond that at the time before Kepler. But as soon as we started being able to measure precise ages for stars older than the sun, what we found was that the young stars, so we're looking at rotation period versus astroseismic age, the young stars uh, followed this normal standard spin down relation as expected. But somewhere around middle age, stars uh, started deviating from that. And in particular, they were rotating more quickly than you'd expect from the standard spin down models. And it looked like almost for a few billion years here, stars are just hanging out at the same uh, rotation rate until they start to expand as subgiants. And so as they expand, they change their moment of inertia and they slow down again. Uh, Jennifer Van Saters led a Nature paper in 2016 that attempted to account for this behavior by basically saying at some critical rotation period for a given mass, you would just shut off magnetic braking and that would essentially freeze the rotation rate until the subgiant phase. And so that yellow model there is a, a model where you just turn off magnetic braking partway through the life of a star. Um, and there were hotter and cooler stars to calibrate the precise uh, age or rotation rate where this happened as a function of mass. And it all happened at a, uh, a magic Rossby number, the ratio of the rotation rate to the convective turnover time. And so for hotter stars, it kicks in at shorter rotation periods, and for cooler stars at, at longer rotation periods. Now coincidentally, in follow-up work, we found that this uh, change in the rotational evolution of stars coincided with a change in their activity cycles. So these benchmark stars that are solar analogs, 18 SCO, a slightly younger version of the sun, Alpha Sen, a slightly older version, 
and 16 sig, a, a, a much more evolved version of the sun. Uh, that evolutionary sequence defines what we think happens uh, to activity cycles uh, during the second halves of stars in the sequence lifetime. So during the normal scuba energy spin down, they just evolve along these sequences. I should explain this diagram. So we're looking at rotation period versus activity cycle period in years. This is data from the Mount Wilson survey. And uh, in 2007, Erica Bonvitens uh, noticed by plotting on this diagram only the very best activity cycles uh, that you could uh, measure from the Mount Wilson survey, that there was not one relationship between these two quantities, but two shown by the solid black lines here. Uh, and she interpreted this as evidence that there were actually two dynamo mechanisms, because in some cases, uh, stars show uh, cycles on both of these sequences simultaneously, as Axel mentioned earlier. So you could have two dynamo mechanisms basically driven in different parts of the star that could operate simultaneously. So her speculation was that this upper sequence of relatively long cycles uh, were driven by a shear layer, like the near surface shear layer in the sun, while these, uh, the lower sequence was driven by uh, something like a tachocline. That's her speculation. In any case, uh, the idea is that activity cycles would evolve along these sequences until they hit that critical Rossby number, in which case the rotation period stays the same, and the activity cycle, apparently, just from this empirical uh, data, gets longer. The amplitude decreases until, at the top, 16 sig has no cycle at all. It's just constant activity. So the magnetic activity is still measurable. It produces mag magnetism, but it's not cyclic anymore. So we think this is uh, basically showing the path that stars take as their dynamos gradually shut down during the second half of their main sequence lifetimes. Okay? Uh, yeah. It's more or less the same, yeah. Um, you saw in the previous diagram, uh, right, their rotation period is almost the same. And so a, a, an evolutionary track where you're not losing any angular momentum to magnetic braking changes very slightly between those two ages, but, but uh, only when it becomes a subgiant does it significantly change. Yeah. Uh, so just to offer kind of a big, big picture here of what might be happening, what we our best current understanding of, of what this might represent. Uh, so as a function of Rossby number, uh, this parameter is a magnetic complexity parameter. You can, can you can think of it as the average spherical harmonic degree of the magnetic field of the large scale magnetic field. So dipole, quadrupole, octopole, so on. Uh, we know uh, empirically that young stars have very complex magnetic fields, and so they don't lose a lot of angular momentum to, to stellar winds. Uh, until they reach this regime where the Rossby number is about 0 0.1, right? So earlier than 0 0.1, they're in this saturated regime where you basically have all the magnetic field that you can possibly produce, and you're changing your rotation rate at essentially constant activity level. Here in the middle, between Rossby number 0.1 and somewhere around 1, you hit the Skumanich regime, where the Skumanich law operates. So you have a direct coupled evolution between rotation and activity. Until you get reach these higher Rossby numbers that the Kepler observations and K2 observations finally uh, reached, where the magnetic complexity continues to increase, uh, and so decoupling rotation and activity from then, from then on. So, so the Skumanich law is basically <laughs> operates in the middle here, and you have something more complex at both ends. And this is the, this is the most successful uh, big, big picture attempt to, to reproduce the behavior that we see both in young clusters 
and in old stars with ages from astroseismology. So far, that's, that's the best we can do. Okay, the, the second big, highly impactful piece of research to come out of HAO was the so-called MHD equation of state. Uh, now, it has nothing to do with magnetohydrodynamics, if that's your suspicion. It's called MHD after the three authors, uh, the three principal authors. authors. Uh, um, Dimitri Mahalas, uh, David Hummer, and Werner Dappen. Uh, and they each basically led one of these three papers in the series describing the various aspects of this new equation of state for stellar envelopes, which is a significant improvement over what was available at the time. Um, and collectively, these three papers have obtained uh, nearly 1,300 citations uh, since it was published, so a higher a number of citations per year since it was published more recently. Uh, and you can see that it was most impactful in the first decade or so before, in particular before the OPAL equation of state was available. Um, and then after that, it was sort of superseded by OPAL, I think. Uh, until, until maybe this year, um, I'd like to uh, let you know about uh, a project that one of my colleagues, uh, Reiner Trampadak, has been working on with Werner Dappen, uh, the only surviving member of that uh, trio, to basically bring the MHD equation of state up to the, uh, up to, uh, the task of, of modern stellar evolution calculations. Uh, so this is better than the original MHD um, equation of state in, uh, in that it incorporates more elements. So the green elements on the top were the original seven elements in the 1988 version of the MHD equation of state. He's expanded this, they have expanded this to 27 elements as well as 187 molecules. Uh, so more elements included, which is important, of course, for opacities. Uh, more physics, so they include uh, the effects of relativistic electrons, Coulomb effects, quantum effects, and an improved treatment of pressure ionization. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, expanded the range of temperatures and pressures and conditions where the, these calculations are done, and a finer grid of models uh, within the, that range. So in all aspects, uh, the number of elements, the amount of physics, and the range uh, of applicability, this is meant to be, uh, MHD 2020 is meant to be a, a, a modern equation of state that can be used uh, for full stellar evolution calculations. Uh, and the most significant um, difference between this and the original, so the original here is shown in pink and the new version in, in black. And the main effect uh, from the standpoint of the sun is that it moves ionization deeper into the sun, right? So you have, here's the bottom of the solar convection zone and that's farther to the interior of the sun. So you basically move ionization deeper into the sun. Uh, so the bottom is the neutral hydrogen and the top is the uh, ionized hydrogen. Uh, and similarly for the, for the various ionization states of iron on the right hand panel there. And basically this is significant because if you have more, um, if the ionization is deeper in the sun, you, you have more bound electrons there to absorb photons, right? So you're changing the distribution of the opacity on the stellar interior. Uh, and you may be aware that that's been a problem for the last 15 years in particular. Uh, the solar abundances were revised in 2005 and have been revised a few times since then. Uh, and they're gradually converging, but basically um, the original, so this is a inversion of the sound speed in the solar interior as a function of fractional radius. The gray shaded area shows you a sense of the uh, theoretical uncertainties in that inversion. Uh, and then these various curves are the, are the best you can do with various assumptions about the solar abundance. And the original one from the 90s, using the gravescence of all abundances, you know, agreed to better than a few parts per thousand across the whole domain. And when these new abundances came out, the AGS-05, the Asplund et al. Uh, abundances, it totally destroyed that agreement. And there's been, Herculean efforts at trying to solve this problem. And probably the most promising uh, single contribution in the last few years has been 
a revised experimental determination of the iron abundances uh, at sun-like conditions uh, in the laboratory by Bailey et al. in, in 2015, uh, showing that iron had a experimentally determined uh, opacity twice as high as these calculations suggest. And uh, MHC 2020 promises to uh, basically help solve this problem by redistributing the opacity as a function of radius, okay? So basically reconciling the new solar abundances with helio seismology once and for all, hopefully once and for all. Okay. Okay, third, and we're gonna hear more about this this afternoon. Uh, HAO was where the first transiting extrasolar planet was discovered. Uh, it was a star, HD 209458, um, that was known to have a planet already from radial velocity observations. And Harvard graduate student and HAO graduate fellow, Dave Charbonneau, along with his advisor, Tim Brown, uh, used a small telescope that Tim made in his garage um, to take precise photometry of this system, uh, not on two six, uh, successive orbits because the orbital period was three and a half days. So three and a half days after you observe this one at night, it's gonna be daytime. So you have to wait seven days to get the second one uh, to confirm that you're actually seeing the planet as expected. And so they, uh, they found the first transiting extrasolar planet two decades ago. Uh, and that paper has been cited uh, more than a thousand times um, in the last 20 years. So an average of 50 citations per year. And you can see a relatively steadle, steady level over, over time. Uh, and then just on the heels of this discovery, just two years later, they used the same system with observations from this Hubble Space Telescope to try to look for uh, the presence of the planetary atmosphere. Um, and so this is spectrophotometry from the Hubble Space Telescope. So you're looking as a function of wavelength, the depth of the transit or the change in the depth of the transit relative to what it is um, on average. And you see that all these different spectral lines show the same transit depth statistically, um, except for one, the sodium D lines here. And so the idea is that if you have a, a constituent in the atmosphere with a sufficient pressure scale height, it makes the planet look a little bit bigger. And so you get a deeper transit, right? And this is a three or four sigma detection of sodium in the first extrasolar planet atmosphere, almost 20 years ago. Huge head start that could have happened here at NCAR. <laughs> um, and that paper by itself, uh, uh, an additional 803 citations in, in the last 20 years, less than 20 years. So that discovery, those discoveries, really paved the way for what came after. Uh, and what came after were Kepler in 2009, so launched uh, nine years after uh, the initial discovery. Uh, but it would, Kepler had been tried for 20 years or something before that. And uh, I, think, I think it's safe to say that the, the, the ability to measure a transit from the ground um, convinced people at NASA that this might be worth doing from space on a large sample of stars. And the main thing, the main uh, most significant thing that Kepler did uh, as a statistical mission was that it showed that these planets that had been discovered from the ground, these big Jupiter-sized planets, they were the exception, not the rule. And that once you had the sensitivity to probe to the small Earth-sized planets, you realize those Earth-sized planets are everywhere. They're, they're the ones that are all over the place. And so um, once you know that small planets are rare, very common, uh, they think they're so common that every star has at least one, smaller than the planet Neptune or something, uh, then it makes sense to probe the whole sky, to search the whole sky as TESS is currently doing, um, to find the nearest examples around the brightest stars where we can do this atmospheric characterization and probe the atmospheres uh, of the best uh, planetary systems that we can find nearby. And so that's the idea, TESS uh, has been surveying uh, the entire sky for almost the last two years and we'll go for another two um, starting this summer. Um, and it's basically building a candidate list that you will be able to follow up with the James Webb Space Telescope um, 
to probe their atmospheres using exactly the technique that Dave Charbonneau and Tim Brown pioneered almost 20 years ago. Um, but possibly for Earth-sized planets around smaller stars. That's pretty exciting. Okay, now finally, uh, I just want to reflect on, uh, on this book called Good to Great. Uh, basically because I think this book, I believe this book, had a, a strong influence on the, on the development of uh, astrophysics uh, in the last decade at HAO. Um, Tom Bogdan and uh, Mike Thompson and I think uh, Scott McIntosh are all fans of this book. And if I, it's basically a business book um, that examines what is the difference between good companies uh, that produce you know, reasonable returns over time and great companies that just continue to grow. Uh, and if I had to summarize the thesis of this book in one sentence, it is that the difference between good and great companies is that the great companies focus on what they do best and got rid of the rest, okay? So in the last decade, uh, HAO interpreted this as focus on what you do best, space weather, and shed the rest. And astrophysics and solar dynamo research uh, went out the door. Uh, but I read this book in 2012, um, and I had a different interpretation. And that interpretation, if you had applied it at the NCAR level, where the budgetary decisions were being made, uh, could have been, focus on what you do best, science. That's what NCAR does. <laughs> and shed the rest, administration yeah. and the Office of Programs. Um, if you look at how the NCAR budget has been allocated in the last decade, you will find that uh, a diminishing fraction has been devoted to, to science at the expense um, yeah, of some of these other programs. So uh, with that, I will put up the summary of the most important, um, highly impactful papers ever to come out of HAO. In fact, these papers are among the most uh, impactful by, measured by citations uh, in all of NCAR. They're in the top 10. Uh, there are a few climate papers that are more highly cited, as you might imagine. Uh, but uh, A, <laughs> All of the most highly cited papers to come out of HAO in its history, these top three, are in astrophysics, not in solar physics. <laughs> Maybe a coincidence, I don't know. Um, B, those advances have direct application to our understanding of both solar physics and atmospheric physics. So it's unclear uh, why the decisions were made that were made. Um, but that's all in the past. Um, Thank you, Michael, and congratulations.